In this inspired insider.com interview, we talk with Joe Sugarman. He's a legend, direct response marketing and copywriting. He's the man behind Blue Blocker sunglasses. They've sold over 20 million pairs. He talks about his biggest failure, and it's pretty epic. It's a great story. Listen up. Also, he talks about some of the triggers that allow us to be better copywriters. That and much more coming up now. <laughs> okay, Jeremy. All right, I'm gonna get started. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have a legend who I consider a friend and mentor, Joe Sugarman. Anyone who doesn't know Joe, he's considered one of the legends of direct response marketing and copywriting. He's the man behind Blue Blocker sunglasses that have sold over 20 million pairs. And he's also credited with introducing the concept of using toll-free numbers to take credit cards over the phone. And at the time, that was unheard of. I've heard stories too that I want to find out firsthand from you, Joe, where you regularly made 300,000 sales per month and sometimes even 250,000 sales in one day. Um, his books include Triggers, Success Forces, The Adwe Copywriting Handbook, and several others. I personally... I mean, anyone who doesn't have it, um, this is one of the best books of all time for copywriting, the Adwee Copywriting Handbook. You can see it's like I've paged through it. I read it about once a year. And, uh, Joe, thank you so much for being here. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's my pleasure, and it's been a while since we talked. It has. And I'm excited to hear your big lessons, even mistakes you've learned in your journey. I like to include a fun fact first. And... A fun fact about you is you were in the CIA and you were actually a double agent in Germany. Tell us about that. Well, uh, it's a long story how I got to Germany, but uh, when I finally got there, I was assigned on several occasions to the CIA and I worked for them part time. And then at, uh, after I got out of the military, I was in military intelligence, never wore a uniform. I was always in civilian clothes and the, and the military taught me how to speak German. I was fluent in German. But I, w I had gotten out of the Army, but I was still in Germany. I was still in Frankfurt because I had things to wrap up. And one thing led to another, and I became a, a double agent and started working. The R Russians thought I was working for them. And, of course, I was wow. communicating wow. all of the information they were giving me to the CIA. And it turned out to be a valuable uh, opportunity. So you even work. used your copywriting skills to take uh, warm showers when you were there. <laughs> tell, tell us about that. Okay. <laughs> well, I was in basic training. Uh, actually, I was drafted, believe it or not. I had three, uh, three and a half years of, uh, of um, uh, th three and a half years of, uh, of uh, electrical engineering background. And I had three and a half years of being an ROTC. I was I was going to be a second lieutenant when I got into the Army, but the Army, in their rush to draft people, because they had just put up the Berlin Wall, drafted me. And so I uh, went to basic training. Then I, um, after basic training, it, well, they give everybody a test, and I scored the highest on this test. I mean, it figures. I, I knew all the military stuff, and I knew all the electrical engineering, and right. so I scored the, probably one of the highest. And they called me out of the company of 2,000 troops. And they sat me down, just like you see in the movies, and they said, uh, Mr. Sugarman, I um, just want you to know that you had the highest score of all 2,000 troops, and that makes you eligible for military intelligence. Uh, which, and uh, we're, 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 we would send you to spy school, and after spy school, we would send you to some foreign country and teach you the language in that country. Are you interested? And I said, yeah, very much so. He says, well, you're going to have to put in an extra year to do that. And I thought about it, and I said, you know, it's probably worth it. So they sent me to the spy school in Fort Holliburd, Maryland. And uh, the, if you can, it was like being in the Army. I mean, they, had, they had bunk beds and, and uh, this huge room where on one side were sinks and mirrors where the guys would shave every morning. And on the other side were showers. And it was the middle of winter, and there was a big fan in the center of the, between the two. 
the fan was there to keep the mirrors clear uh, and get out all the moisture. Well, if you were taking a shower, it was brutal. I mean, I mean, the wind blowing through, you, you wanted to get in and out real quick, and it was very uncomfortable. So one day I got upset, you know, and I said, to hell with it. So I go over to the fan, I shut it off. Every, the people's uh, mirrors, the troops' mirrors are starting to fog up. Um, somebody goes over, turns it back on. Well, I did this a couple days, turned it off, and somebody turned it back on. So I said, you know what? I want to make up the sign. I want to come up with a sign so nobody touches that switch. So I went to an office supply store, got some stencils and stuff, and in the middle of the night I got up and I made this military sounding sign that said anybody touching the switch, turning it on or off, will be subject to court martial and uh, will be dismissed from this um, school and will be subject to part 407 of the Military Justice Act. And I, in the middle of the night I posted that. Next morning I walk in, I turn on the uh, I, I, I go up to the fan, I switch it off, I step into the shower, I take the longest shower you could imagine. Everybody's mirrors are fogging up. <laughs> and and that uh, uh, was so funny to see this. So then the next day I did the same thing, except I didn't take that long a shower. But I was the, and people are looking at me, the other troops are looking at me and they're thinking, oh, this guy's going to get in real trouble. Anyway, I did this for three weeks and I got away with it until I was called down to the commanding general's office. And the commanding general says, Mr. Sugarman, I understand you've been violating Part 407 of the Military Justice Act. What do you say for yourself? You know, and I was between a rock and a hard place. What, what do I do, tell the truth? Well, I always believe in telling the truth. So I said, I told him, I said, I told him exactly what I did. And halfway through my explanation, he's starting to laugh. And then when I finish, he is laughing. He says, Sugarman, we need more people like you in the military. I've got this juicy assignment in Frankfurt, Germany. I'm going to send you there. They're going to teach you the language. You're going to be in a special, uh, very high, uh, secret, uh, top secret uh, position. And uh, and uh, that's what happened. They sent me to Germany. I, I never wore a uniform again, and uh, I had a very uh, very nice position. And the rest I guess that interaction could have gone either way, right? And I guess it went in the in the right direction for you. Um, Joe, so where do you get that? Um, you have that natural sense for, for copywriting and persuasion. Where does that come from? Well, I think I look at every problem as an opportunity. And I look at every problem as an, as an opportunity so great that it dwarfs the problem. So whenever I have a problem, I think, well, how could I solve this? What are some of the different ways I could solve these, uh, these problems? And, and that Army experience is, <laughs> is, is one example. But there are many others throughout my whole life. Yeah, uh, yeah. One of the other things, too, is I've always believed I was going to be a success. Uh, and it was this constant belief that got me through a lot of failures because I, I thought to myself, well, it's just a temporary thing. I'll, I'll be successful. I just have to per per persevere. Was there something that happened when you were growing up that allowed you to have that mindset? Um, no, it was just I, just I just really believed I would be a success. It was just... Um, uh, you know, uh, my um, cousin is a psychiatrist, and at one time he was hired by the San Diego Chargers to uh, determine what it took to be a superstar. And he studied the San Diego Chargers, studied all the football teams, and he came up with, the, he wrote a book about it, but he came up with the conclusion that there were two types of superstars. One that had very big egos, like remember Jim McMahon of the Chicago Bears, were a real big ego. Or two that are very religious, uh, Tebow, for example. So one of the two, and when you think about it, really both groups had very strong beliefs. One believed, in, one person believed in himself, and the other person believed in a higher power. Mm -hmm. So I had this belief that I was going to be a success. So whatever happened to me, I would always think, well, it's it's just temporary, or it's 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 the, it's the best thing that could happen actually, right. uh, because I'll yeah, I'm learning from it, and I'll be I'll be very successful yeah. in the long run anyway. How did you get started in? Wh where did you first get started in your copywriting career? First get started, um, actually it was in grammar school. I was probably about fourth. Well, actually, uh, no, I shouldn't say that. I um, when I was in first grade believe this or not, they held a citywide, I lived in Chicago, they held a citywide contest for a slogan. 
And my slogan, everybody participated, all the schools, the high schools, the grammar schools, and I was only in second grade. My, um, <laughs> my uh, submission won an honorable mention, and there were only a few honorable mentions given. And uh, I was awarded that. So it was kind of the first indication hmm. that I, well, maybe I have something going here. Um, uh, but then in fifth grade, the teacher gave everybody an assignment. And the assignment was to write something and then read it to the class. And so write, write a composition. So I wrote a very funny one making fun of the teacher. And when I got up in front of the class and read it, the students just cracked up. The teacher didn't like it, by the way. The teacher was a little You're upset. always pushing the envelope. <laughs> but, but the class loved it, and I, I saw what a great thrill it was to be able to do that. And um, so when I got to high school, I worked in the school newspaper. I was a photographer for the paper. I was also writing columns. I published my own magazine while I was in high school. Um, so I was always writing. I was always uh, writing. It was just, and I've always found that the more you write, the better you get. It's one of these things where you put in like ten thousand hours writing, and you're going to be right. a good writer. After your military days, what? Uh, when did you first start selling products? Um, when did I first start selling products? It actually happened while I was in Germany. Uh, I uh, met some people who w uh, were in the ski lift business and wanted to sell ski lifts. And uh, they approached me, and I got a hold of a good, couple good friends of mine and had them come out to Austria where these ski lifts were built. And I, start, I became a, a ski lift salesman. I, I, um, got, I, I didn't, I, my job was to create the advertising, and my partner was to do the installation and the selling. And I did a pretty good job of advertising because a couple of the ski resorts said, uh, we're not interested in a um, ski lift right now, but we would really like to have you write or give us some good advertising direction. And so I, ha I had about three or four of those ski resort accounts and realized I had an ad agency, you know. So I started uh, a little agency where I was handling these ski resorts. And then there was a politician that asked me if I could uh, help him. It was a friend of mine, and I did, and uh, he won. And as a consequence of that, I started doing political ads for the Democratic Party in, in the uh, Chicago area. And uh, I had a wonderful track record. Eighty-five percent of my uh, candidates won. Wow. But but about 50% of those eventually went to jail, but that's Chicago politics. <laughs> that wasn't... Well, so what were some of the things you used in your, in your copy at the time with, with politics and with the ski lift that, you, that worked really well? Well, uh, to get, get people involved, uh, have people look forward to receiving your, your message. Uh, we would send out... Um, for example, a folder that unfolded and said expand, expand your ski lift operation, and you know, real clever little uh, bits like that. Um, but I don't know if I can answer that really uh, fairly, uh, but it was just this unique uh, off the wall, more off the wall the better. Um, but I had, I had experiences um, that taught me a lot, even when I was in high school, I, I could share with you. Uh, um, I went to Oak Park River Forest High School. You're familiar with that. Yeah, yeah. And um, I had a chemistry class, and the person sitting next to me or standing next to me in the chemistry class, uh, we, we would have um, lab work one day a week, and then the other four days a week we would have classroom. So in the lab work, the guy that was sitting next to me or standing next to me kept spilling chemicals on, on my table. Uh, got me uh, some on my clothes, and I got really upset with him. And I said, "You jerk!" I said, "What? What the hell are you doing right now? You get getting me all." And he says, "Oh, if you you look and you want to fight." And I look at him. And he's like, "I was 150 pounds. He was about 100 pounds." And I said, "Yeah, okay, I'll I'll fight." <laughs> so he said, "He says, okay, yeah, uh, where?" I said, "How about Greenfield Park? That's right across from my home." I said, "Okay." And uh, what time? I said, 4 o'clock. He says, okay, I'll be there at 4 o'clock. 
sure enough, four o'clock. And I, by the way, I called all my friends. I said, "You got to come out and watch this fight. This is going to be a, a kind of a quick thing, but I want you to witness it." I went home. I got dressed all in white, and the reason for it is, if I punch the guy, and I get, and and he starts bleeding, I you can see it, you know, very contrasted. But if I had something more, if I was wearing black, you wouldn't be able to see it. So I had white everything: white shoes, white pants, white shirt. Um, Anyway, the day arrives, or the time arrives, and I go out there, and, and sure enough, I see all my friends, and I see him, and then they're all waiting for me. And before we started, I wanted to wave to my friends and acknowledge them for coming and thank them. So I waved to them, and then I turned around to face my opponent, and before I could even lift my hand, he punches me in the face, and I start bleeding all over my white clothes. I mean, <clears throat> I couldn't stop the blood from running. I couldn't stop bleeding. I race home. Fortunately, it was just a few yards, uh, you know, down the street. I was worried about my mom because if she saw me, she'd die. I mean, she she'd be so sorry to see what happened to me. So when I walked in, I said, "Mom, please, just take me to the hospital. I think I need some stitches. Don't get excited. I'm person perfectly okay." And she took one look at me, started screaming, <laughs> "Take me to the hospital. They stitch me up. I'm okay. Everything's fine." Now, two years later, almost to the day, this jerk, this idiot, married my sister. <laughs> so when you think about it, it took two years, but I finally got even with him. Oh, my so God. Anyway, yeah, by the way, they've been married 55 years. And, uh, uh, so, and that's a true story. And, and one of the things I learned from that was to never be overconfident. You never, ever know. You never know. So I was never, I was always cautious. I was always looking at both sides of, of the issue. So if, you know, what, what's the worst case scenario? What's the best case scenario? What do I have to look out for? Um, anyway, so how, was, did you, how did you get started with blue blockers? Well, uh, again, my philosophy is always for every problem, there lies an opportunity so great that it dwarfs the problem. And I was doing a, an eight-page insert in the United Airlines magazine. And I was doing this insert, and um, one of the pages of the eight pages it was devoted to a product that no longer existed because the company went out of business. And here I was stuck, and I had to fill a full-page ad. Well, I remember being in California a couple of weeks earlier, and a friend of mine handed me a pair of sunglasses that I put on, and I was amazed at the clarity and, and how relaxed my eyes were. And in fact, I wasn't squinting. And I said, "I said I got to, I got to get these sunglasses." He says, "No, no, you don't want to. They were made for NASA for the astronauts, and um, they, 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 it's just too expensive. They're like three, four hundred dollars a piece." And the company that was making them is going out of business. And I says, well, you know, I can probably get them made in the Far East. He says, yeah, but uh, uh, don't, don't, don't even worry, think about it. So when I got back and realized I was missing that page, I, you know, I had a problem. So I called up my friend and I said, hey, look, at, I really need a product right now. Send it over, Rush. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll source the product. Uh, I'll find a place to, to get them. I've got two months to do that, but I've got a deadline to get this insert finished within the next few days. So he sent me the pair of sunglasses. I came up with the name Blue Blocker. I photographed them, wrote the ad so quick, sent it to the publication along with the seven other ads. And then I sat back and I sourced a couple thousand pair from Korea. That's my first source, South Korea, by the way. Um, and uh, then the ad ran, and I, I'll never forget, I was given the, um, the results in a kind of a printout, of a computer printout, and I was going to study that on a, on a flight I was taking to Detroit. So I'm sitting on the airplane, and I'm looking at this, this report, and it shows uh, that I sold out of all 2,000 pairs of sunglasses, and that all the rest of them I had maybe sold 50, 20, 30, 40. And this was just in the very beginning of the set, and I realized I had a huge hit on my hands. And the rest is history. I, 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 I advertised for a year in every magazine I could get my hands on. I spent like a million dollars on just advertising. And um, I sold like, uh, if you can remember this figure, 100,000 pair 
during a period of about six to eight months. And then I heard about infomercials were, that were allowed, that President Reagan had um, a, a, announced that uh, you could have half-hour commercials, that they were deregulating the, the uh, federal uh, agency responsible for overseeing this. And so I said, well, I'm going to try that. Everybody thought I was nuts, by the way. They said, how could you sell a pair of sunglasses on TV? People try them on. They want to look through them. And, of course, we patterned our show. But people don't realize that an infomercial is really entertainment. And so we, I said, I'm going to create a very entertaining show that helps sell the product. And I remember I said we sold 100,000 pair over six to eight months. We sold 100,000 pair the first month that we had our commercial. We ran infomercials for um, uh, four or five years, and during that time, uh, our sales just continually increased, and it got to a point where we were selling 300,000 pair a month, wow. and um, uh, doing very, very well, and I was keeping it very confidential, because there are a lot of, there were government people out there, there were uh, competitors, and you got to sometimes keep your success kind of quiet, which I did. Um, so but anyway. what worked? What 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 did you do in those infomercials that you um, felt at the time was working so well? Well, the uh, what, um, what 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 you do is you again you provide entertainment. So I was providing. Uh, I, I figured a for, I wanted to figure out a format that that this product could fit into, and I came up with Candid Camera. And if you remember back in the days, Candid Camera was where they stopped people and, 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 and they did something strange and the person reacted kind of funny, and it was, it was kind of an entertaining show. And, and so I created a Candid Camera where I'd walk up to somebody, hand them a pair of sunglasses, they'd put them on, they'd go, wow, whoa, wow, this is different, you know. And, and we got a lot of those, and some of them were very entertaining. And as a consequence, um, uh, people loved the show. They, they saw it as entertaining. And, uh, of course, it generated an enormous amount of sales. Yeah, yeah. So I know you, you, know, you write the book Triggers, and uh, you wrote the book Triggers, and it's really good. What, what, um, how do you incorporate, and what are some of the specific triggers you use in your copy? Uh, okay, well, um, I wrote a book called Triggers. And in the book, I uh, talk about 30 psychological triggers that help uh, help you uh, uh, exchange, help you uh, sell your product to the consumer. How, how you help them exchange their hard-earned money for your product or service. And uh, in fact, I have the, the book that you showed uh, before. This is the Adwe Copywriting Manual. It has all triggers in there, and it's it's uh, it's all about copywriting. And um, so, your your question was, uh, what specific triggers do you use in your, oh, or how do you use the specific triggers in your copy? Well, I found a couple that are uh, very powerful. They're all very important. But I had one, for example. Um, it's called satisfaction conviction. And what it really means is, if you offer somebody a thirty day home trial. Uh, that's normal. But if you say to somebody, look at, use this for a year, and if you're not happy, anytime within that year, return it and get all your money back, that goes way beyond just the trial period. That, that's a satisfaction conviction. I'm so convinced that this pro product is so good for you that I am willing to make an offer that is so incredible. And we have, I have written 1,000 word ads and taken, uh, uh, well, 1,000 word ads and, and changed like one little sentence at the end of that ad offering a satisfaction conviction and sales just exploded. So I realized that was really important. Another one is curiosity. Uh, you've got to make every part of your ad uh, interesting enough so that they'll want to read the next part. For example, they look at the headline and they say, oh, wow, I've got to read, uh, what was the subheadline? And they read the subheadline and they see the pictures under the, ca uh, the captions under the pictures and and they just they get into it so uh, curiosity you want to get them to read that first sentence so I um, and I've made a lot of mistakes too that's how I discovered all these triggers uh, 
but uh, th those are a couple of uh, probably the most important yeah. uh, that I found. But uh, creating a, an environment, uh, for example, is one trigger. If you create another trigger, would be um, storytelling. People love stories. Um, they love stories. They, they they don't. The facts are okay, but they just love to to hear stories. And storytelling is a great. I didn't realize how often I use storytelling to start my ads. Um, one example was uh, we did a, um, a a commercial for uh, or an ad for a thermostat, and I started off the ad saying what a what a stupid looking case it had. It, it uh, used old technology. It, uh, it it was the stupidest product I've ever seen, but then something came up that really impressed me, and I followed that. And here's what I here's what here's why I think it was the most ex most incredible product you could ever imagine. Well, you start reading that, and you you got to you got to hear the the right. ending. Of how how what am I doing? What's this guy doing? <laughs> Thermos that, and he's knocking it. You know. So those are a couple of the triggers, and I have 30 of them in the uh, Adweek Copywriting Manual. And boy, I'll tell you, that, or handbook, it's the Adweek Copywriting Handbook. Yeah. And that's like, on Amazon, I think it's like $15, $20 or something. It's very inexpensive, but I, I guarantee you that anybody who gets that uh, book and, and, and reads it, well, it'll change their lives. Oh, I agree. Uh, yeah, I completely most, agree. The most powerful thing that uh, you as an entrepreneur or anybody as an entrepreneur can do, man or woman, uh, youngster, oldster, it doesn't matter, is being able to communicate through your copywriting. Because then you reach millions of people. Uh, the key to success is to duplicate yourself. Yeah. And um, you do that by... Uh, you do that uh, simply by writing copy that you can disseminate to millions of people. Yeah, you can, you've mastered this art of storytelling. If someone's you know thinking, well, how do I become a better storyteller? What advice do you give them? Well, uh, keep in mind curiosity, because when you start, like um, I might start an ad. The story I am about to tell you may seem incredible, but it's the absolute truth. Well, you're kind of hooked, you know. You 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 want to find out the uh, the, the rest of it. So um, it, it's just, you know. No, again, the question. <laughs> sometimes I'm the you know, um, the storytelling. What what advice would you have? I guess what you're saying is to follow some of those triggers and that will kind of help formulate a story around some of those specific triggers because that will keep people's curiosity and and keep them interested exactly you what you want to do is create uh... The, you want to create that slippery slide we call it the slippery or i call it slippery slide where you start reading and you cannot stop until you finish the ad and i've had people do that and write me and say look at i am not interested in buying your products I just want you to know you waste my time. Every time I see an ad in the Wall Street Journal or in the Fortune or whatever, I, I read it because I'm so compelled to read it, and you've wasted so much of my time. I mean, I've gotten letters like that, believe it or not. Uh, that's so, a high compliment. That's, yeah, really, uh, kind of indirect, but yeah, it's a good one. So what are some of the, obviously you've had a lot of successes. What are some of the mistakes or failures along the way? Well, you always have failures, but I never consider them failures. I consider them learning experiences. Uh, I'm about to publish a new book. It's called The Seven Forces of Success. The Seven Forces of Success. And failure is one of the success forces. The more often you fail, the closer you get to success. We're all, it's like you, we're all given up, let's say, a bucket of oysters. I like this analogy. We're all given a bucket of oysters. And in in the one of those oysters is a pearl and you know that so you start opening up the oysters and you realize it's not easy because it's, it scratches you it hurts you and and so a lot of people just give up but if you keep going that pearl might be the last might be the last uh, uh, or in the last oyster or it might be in the second to last you never know you just keep digging and you keep doing what you think you're supposed to be doing and eventually you'll be successful yeah so what was the time for you that you had to keep digging? It wasn't, it wasn't in that first uh, oyster. Oh, 
Uh, there, there were times where I, uh, at, after even after the military, where I would be running teen clubs or, uh, well, a good example is my Batman credit card. Um, yeah, tell was, people what happened with that. Oh, this is a story. Um, this credit card is 47 years old, and it, uh, it came out in 1966, and the story behind it is a good story about perseverance. Um, <laughs> it's a, oh, it's a, it's, well, anyway, the long story short, is in 1966, Batman came out on television. And uh, everything that had Batman on sold like crazy. I mean, Batman t-shirts, Batman this, Batman that. And uh, the same year, and, and it became a fad, by the way, and the same year, another fad hit. And that was that all the banks, all the financial institutions, would issue credit cards or what they called plastic money to their customers so if you had a checking account or a savings account uh, or any kind of an account at a bank you would get this this plastic money and they were encouraging people to go out and use it and people were, were using it and became really big so that was became a fad and I said I thought to myself you know what Batman's a fad credit cards a fad I'm gonna present and I want to see if I can get a license to sell a Batman credit card. So I call up the Licensing Corporation of America who are li issuing the licenses. I talk to this guy, Murray. Murray, I explain the concept to him. He says, Joe, that's ingenious. Come to New York and present it to our president. I'm sure we'll want to talk to you about this. And so I flew to New York, and, I mean, Batman was appeared on the cover of Time magazine. I mean, th this was a huge fad. I go into the office, I present my idea, I had graphics, I had everything all prepared. And, uh, and, and um, anyway, the president of National Periodical Pub or excuse me, of Licensing Corporation of America stood up and said, Mr. Sugarman, we have been presented with hundreds of ideas for Batman products. As a matter of fact, the other day we licensed Batman peanut butter. He says, this is the most ingenious idea because what I explained was, well, we take the card, we sell them for a dollar a piece with everybody's name embossed. But what we do is we we create a mailing list of a million names, and then we send out a catalog listing all of the Batman products. Very smart idea, yeah. They they flipped out on this. <laughs> it was so terrific. I said, well, what do I do next? And they says, they, they says, well, we want to become partners with you. Yeah, I'm just, I mean. Batman partners with Joe Sugarman, this young guy in the advertising. So, so uh, anyway, I raced back home. I got a credit card printer to, to give me and uh, get ahead of everybody else. I explained the situation. I got radio spots made up. I had uh, every. I even had a Batman. Um, uh, what do you call it? A Batman. Uh, I had a few ancillary Batman pro things too, as well, like a certificate, a, a warranty that if you lose your Batman card, you 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 know you you won't get into trouble. I know it's just some spoofy kind of things, and then um, uh, got I had everything, and I had this done within like ten days. They were starting to deliver these Batman credit cards. Oh, that's quick. I had, yeah, it was they they rushed through because they realized it was a fad, and. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, they're delivering the credit cards to my office because I didn't want them to go to the embosser until I got the license. And I kept calling, and this guy Murray wouldn't return my call. And finally, after about two or three days of calling, I fly out there, wait in the waiting room. And finally, this guy Murray comes out, and he says, Joe, I don't know how to tell you this, but the president of National Periodical Publications, the man that owns the rights to Batman, we just license. The man that owns the rights doesn't like your idea and will not issue a license. Oh, I, says, I said, I, I, I owe you know, hundreds of people. Anyway, long story short, I said, look, let me meet with the guy. So I met with him that afternoon. They set up an appointment. Give you an idea what kind of guy he was. As I'm walking in, he buzzes his secretary on, on the, his intercom. He says, Marie, get me a cigar. Marie walks in at the other end of his desk is his box. He, she opens the box, takes out a cigar, unwraps it, puts it in his mouth, and lights it. I said, this is the guy I'm going to be dealing with. Oh. Good luck. 
So I, I talked to him and I told him the whole story and I told him I had my every penny of my, just invested in this and and if he could just give me enough, you know, give me one city or one town that I can sell it in, just just to earn back with the money that I've you know spent. And he said, um, are you finished, kid? And I said, yeah, I'm finished. He says, well, I just want you to know I've made $60 million off this Batman thing. I don't like your idea. And so as far as I'm concerned, you're not going to do it. Because if you do, I'm going to sue your ass. Now you can get out of here. Could not believe it. I, you know, it's one thing to realize I was going to make a million dollars and I was going to be set for life. And it was another thing to realize I was flat broke and owed people a lot of money. And so what I did was I went back and I talked to all my creditors and I said, I'll, every month I'll send you a check. Sometimes it won't be big, it'll be small, and, but eventually I'll repay you. And after a couple of years I did. And then I called again the licensing corp to think maybe they changed their mind. They didn't. Every year I would call up. Finally in 1978, um, they were coming out with a movie called Superman. And I called to check to see if there was a chance of getting a license. And they said, yep. There's a good chance because we're coming out with this movie. We're promoting all of our superheroes. So I'll get back to you. He got back to me. He says, yes, you've got it. We're going to issue you a license. Finally. Anyway, 12 years had passed. And so when I came up with this promotion, uh, it bombed. Nobody was interested in getting a Batman credit card. The, the time had expired, really. So um, everything was kind of cool until the year 2000. I still had all these Batman credits. I still had a quarter of a million Batman credits. Really? Cards. Holy cow. So, uh, so uh, in, it was the year 2000. I was giving a seminar. A guy by the name of Dan Kennedy. You probably uh, sure. heard of him. He um, was, uh, was at my seminar. He was speaking at, at my seminar. And he walked up to me and he says, Joe, you remember that Batman credit card? And I said, yeah, I remember that. He says, well, you gave me one a long time ago. I gave it to... Uh, a good friend of mine. A good friend of mine gave it to his son. His son put it on eBay and sold it for four hundred dollars. Whoa. So I took out my calculator and I you know <laughs> only only had eight digits. I had I needed one that was bigger. So I went into my office and got one that was bigger. I realized I had a hundred million dollars worth of Batman credit cards sitting in the store. <laughs> anyway, it's forty six years ago. I still have pretty close to a quarter of a million. I pass these out at speeches that I give, you know, to to, to various people. Um, but anyway, that that that's the Batman story, and that that uh, is uh, something that took well, forty six years ago, and uh, probably probably the biggest one of the biggest disappointments in my life because I was so close to making that million. Back then, a million dollars was a was a lot of money, but it just didn't work. It didn't happen. But, you know, I said to myself, okay, there'll be other opportunities. How did you, I mean, you, you capitalized pretty quickly on that. How did you get the funds to even purchase that amount? Like if someone right now is, wants to start something, um, what advice would you have for them? What did you do at the time to actually generate the money to, to even purchase that many cards? Well, keep in mind, Batman was so big. And uh, everybody saw the potential of this, and uh, they were willing to risk their position. I mean, I had a mailing house that was going to provide credit for me. I had an embossing house that was going to, I had the bank, I had a bank that said, hey, we'll take the dollar that comes in, we'll process it on magnetic tape and send it to the embosser. That's how we do our credit cards. I mean, I had everybody cooperating. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but and I did. I paid everybody back. It took a couple of years, but I paid everybody back. Yeah. And uh, and again, timing was more important than anything else. Uh, unfortunately, my timing was off. But uh, no, that, that's <laughs> some serious perseverance. It's becoming a collectible. The back, the back of the card has the humorous terms and condition. It's um, all right. I'll, I'll read these to you. It says, uh, valid only for by firms honoring Batman credit cards and authorized by the Batman credit card company. Uh, loss or theft of this card must be reported immediately to the commissioner's office. Bills payable upon receipt delinquent accounts result in loss of credit privileges and a big spanking. Not valid for payment of income tax. And then there's a place in the back where you sign it. And I have a lot of fun just going to a restaurant and they, they say... Uh, 
Well, I say, what credit cards do you accept? And they say, oh, we accept them all. I say, okay. So I, I put the card in upside down, and they walk away, and you can always see they stop. And they put the card, and then they turn around. It's a lot of fun. They don't quite know what to do with it. It's, it's a lot of fun. Well, how did it work And when you first came up with the idea to take orders over the phone? Because you pretty much started um, that industry. Yeah. Yeah, see, at the time... At the time, they had toll-free numbers, of course, uh, um, and, but you were not allowed to take a credit card order over the telephone because you needed to be valid. You needed a signature from the uh, purchaser. So I would get calls. We were in, at, at that particular time, I think it was 73. We were getting calls from people that would say, uh, I, I need to get this catheter. I'm leaving on a trip. Uh, please, could you send it off today? I'll pay the freight charges, whatever it costs. And just sign my name to the, the charge slip. So I did. And I did this for about six months and never got ripped off. And I helped a lot of people that way. And I said, gee whiz, this has got to be a really good method. So I hired some order takers, I, hired, I, I got more toll-free lines, and I put very small on the coupon of our ads, credit card buyers call toll-free. We were deluged. We broke even before noon on, a, on an ad that was just an average ad. And I said, my God, this is incredible. And I kept doing it. And then finally, I got a call from... Uh, the um, I think it was uh, Bell Systems, and it was the marketing manager for Bell Systems, and he says, Mr. Sugarman, we know what you've been doing as far as credit card order taking over the and I said, oh boy. I said, okay. He says, well, we, we've also been tracking your success, and we see how successful you've been. And we've decided to authorize and allow credit card orders to be um, taken over the phone. And we'd like to take your story and feature it as in a full-page ad in the Wall Street Journal. And sure enough, that's what they did. And it turned the whole direct marketing industry upside down. Catalogs proliferated. Call centers opened up. Fulfillment houses opened up. I mean, it just created a whole genre of, of, of spinoffs as a result of that. And that's probably the thing that I'm most proud of, actually, believe it or not, because uh, it, it did have such a positive uh, effect on the on the industry, and we had about a year jump. Everybody was kind of hesitant to do this, you know. But we had about a year jump, and it turned out to be very successful. I've always wanted to ask you this too. What are some of your favorite headlines of all time? My my favorite headlines. Uh, we had. Um, <laughs> I started a company called the Consumers Hero. And the idea was I had a friend who would get all of these used products back from major department stores because people would return them. And so his job was to take off the brand name, polish it up, and then sell it as a, at a real cheap price. So I said, well, let me start a company. Let's start a company together. You supply the products. I'll supply the marketing. And uh, my headline for the, um, uh, for the ad was hot. The word hot, and the subheadline was something along the lines of, um, "We have this hot merchandise that uh, we, you know we we're interested in liquid, you know, kind of kind of like it was illegal." Right. And then, you know, of course, you'd read the ad and you'd find out that it's not illegal. You join the club, but that that ad just drew lots of people because they just you know, you, you're, you're shocking. Looking, yeah, you're looking through a magazine and you see that headline. And then uh, everything in the ad made you think that we were selling stolen merchandise uh, until you got near the end. That's <laughs> so, a great one. So that that was uh, then um, uh, the one we did for our uh, the, that we did for our thermostat was the headline was magic baloney. Magic baloney. Magic baloney, of course, and then it, it got into the fact that. Yeah, the products were kind of, uh, the product was not magic. It was called Magic Stat. And uh, anyway, the, the, the very interesting story about that product, we promoted it for three years, and it actually became a brand name. 
And uh, we did so well with it that um, the company that sold us product was bought out by Honeywell. Oh, wow. And I get, a, I get a call from the owner of the company, and he says, Joe, I want to thank you for all that effort. just want you to know Honeywell bought our company for $20 million. Thank you very much for all your help. And I said, well, God, I'm le left with nothing. <laughs> you know, I said, well, you know, from now on, I'm going to do a product. I'm going to do one where I own the name. And that's how Blue Blocker, that's one of the ways Blue Blocker uh, happened. So, Joe, obviously you're a pioneer. Who are some of your mentors? Who do you get advice from? That's, that's really funny because um, I used to read the old, well, when I, uh, I, there were a few situations where I w was put in a selling situation. And um, uh, what I did was I read all of the books on selling, on marketing, everything that was available at the time. And so although I can't point to a specific mentor, uh, my mentorship encompassed studying a lot of books. I read a lot. I was, I was becoming an expert uh, I was becoming an expert on uh, selling and marketing, and it led itself, of course, to copywriting. Who were some of the Do you remember any of those people who you were studying? Oh, wow. Um, the, the names elude me right I now. I know we're talking uh, 50 years or, or so, but... Yeah, um, well, I, I remember there was one... Uh, Wheeler was his name. He, he wrote a number of sales books... And the, uh, I remember one book in particular called Dangerous Selling. And the concept there was you reached a point the customer is definitely not going to buy your product. So here's what you do. Here's some of your options of what you can do to change the situation. And right. it's, you might find it to be dangerous. It's just gutsy is basically what it was. So that was Wheeler. He wrote that. Um, what about Lately? Anyone that you um, recommend people follow for uh, advice or instruction? Uh, not really. I think uh, I think uh, John Carlton is a very good writer, a very a very smart guy. Uh, uh, Gary, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, a few other. A few other uh, very good writers that are around. Uh, some of them have passed away, uh, but there are a few that are still around. That yeah. are very good. So what would you say, you know, people who are sitting down, they just have writer's block. What's your routine when you're sitting down to write great copy? Well, first of all, to, you become an expert on the product. Become an absolute expert. Uh, we were presented with a digital watch. I asked every question I can think of. I went to the factory and they explained that they sealed a certain module with a laser. And so I call it the laser beam digital watch. In other words, the more you get into a product, the more detail you get into, the more you become an expert, the more ideas will pop out. Uh, the second thing is to not worry. If, you, if you're having a rough time coming up with an idea, just put it aside. Because your brain, believe it or not, is working on it 24-7. And uh, you, you're taking a shower and all of a sudden, boom, out pops the, uh, the idea. So uh, you, know, you shouldn't be affected by a writer's block. If, uh, I, I don't believe in it. So what else do you do when you uh, really want to dig deep? And you know, Obviously, you've written a lot of ads in your day. What else do you do um, when you're really looking at the copy and, and honing in? Do you just do it in one draft now, or do you have to kind of come back to it? Well, it's really interesting. What, what I typically do is I just write. Uh, I don't care about grammar or punctuation or anything. I just, just write. And then it's in the editing process where you go back and you kind of simplify things and you take out words that you don't need and all that kind of stuff. So you just get it down on paper. There have been a few times when I came up with, I came up with an ad, uh, and I, I didn't have to change a word. It was just, it just flowed right out. Uh, Joe Carbo is a good example of somebody when he wrote *The Lazy Man's Way to Riches*. That was a famous book back then, and it just happened. It just came right out. Um, uh, other times, uh, it doesn't happen that way. I mean, you, you have to really, uh, you have to struggle with it. So it's, it, it varies. You know, 
Yeah. Joe, I have one last question for you. I really appreciate your time, by the way. Um, I want to hear, tell people what, where people can find more about you. What are you working on now that you're most excited about? Well, I'm in the biotech business right now. We have a, a hair growth product that grows hair on bald My wife would love you, yeah. Well, it's for both men and women. And uh, we're going through clinical studies right now. And that thing could be huge. Uh, again, it could be another blood blocker. Um, uh, the biotech company also has other products. But um, right now, the big one that we're focused on is the uh, hair product. Uh, Blue, Blue Blocker is still in business. Uh, 27 years, we, we have a wonderful mailing list. We have a lot of fans. Uh, Blue Blockers appeared in the movie uh, Back to the Future. Uh, no, not Back to the Well, we, had, we were in Back to the Future, too. But uh, Blue Blockers have been in the movie The Hangover. Oh, wow. Uh, worn by the Baby, as well as Zach Galifianakis. Um, we've had uh, some really interesting exposure with rock groups. Uh, um, and uh, Mickey Six, I don't know if the name rings a bell, but he's a big endorser of Blue Blockers. And, uh, or Nikki Six, I'm sorry. And um, uh, yeah, so we, we, we have, uh, we have, we're still r running very strong with Blue Blocker. So where can people find out the hair growth? My wife will buy a case for me, probably. <laughs> well, we're not quite ready yet, but uh, we will be in about three or four months. Okay. Yeah, and it's 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 from our studies so far. It really is this uh, fabulous product. Wow. So my last question for you is, um, and I have a I have a good story. When I was actually uh, in Maui and uh, I got the to meet with you, I go up to the front of the hotel and I said, "Do you know how to get here?" And they looked. They took one look and they go, "How do you know Joe Sugarman?" So you must be known by everyone in in Maui, I think. Um, my question is, uh, what's the what do you think the headline should be for your interview? For my interview, uh, <laughs> hot. A, should, I, should I label it hot? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. I'd have to. I'll have to incubate on that one. Okay. Uh, but. Uh, that's funny you bring that up. That's yeah, you want a, a really interesting how to make a million dollars in mail order, you know, or um, uh, you figure it out. I figure I have the legend on, I might as well ask him. <laughs> well, that's, that's good, that's good thinking, Joe. I really appreciate your time. Everyone should, um, where what site should they go to, to check out you more about you and what you're, what you're up to? Yeah, it's a good question. We're working on the site now, it'll be called uh, Joe Sugar and dot com mm -hmm. and um, uh, it'll have a lot of information about me right now there's somebody that's uh, there are a lot of people trying to imitate me uh, so you know with the internet and all this kind of stuff but that would be a good one Joe dot com mm -hmm. um, blueblocker dot com there it's always an interesting site for people uh, if you want to get the Adweek copywriting uh, handbook uh, or any of my other books that are available, you can go to Amazon.com. They have it also in Kindle. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's, um, there's a lot of places. You just go on the Internet and type in my name. Yeah, you're there. all yeah. over the place. Yeah, you can't hide now. Joe, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's a true honor to, to have you on. Well, it's an honor to be on, and I uh, appreciate uh, everything that you're doing. You're a chiropractor who's gone into... Uh, a lot of other things, and our scientist it was a chiropractor as well. So, okay. So keep on cracking those bones. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.